done. Uh, this is, I, I didn't feel like it was yet time to kind of leave the Heart for the House series. Um, you know, we said that it was for a month, and that month has come, and it's gone. But I wanted to kind of uh, land this thing today, because as I was looking at, you know, how much you guys gave, and what happened, and, you know, all that stuff that, you know, we, we did over the last month, I could see that something really special has happened in our church, happened in you guys, all right? I, I feel like our church has now taken a very, very special shift, that we've shifted away from kind of what we were now into uh, this new thing that we are. We didn't go from bad to good. Uh, we've gone from good to gooder, you right, you know? And, and, that, and that, to me, has been really special to see. I, I've seen it like all, all over. Okay, so I, I get messages from you. I get messages from others. Uh, we have a thing here uh, that we do called impact stories where staff or volunteers or elders, they, they email me uh, just a story, like an impact story. And it, it's not like a fully like, you know, uh, introduction, body, con- you know, conflict resolution, conclusion, you know, not that kind of letter. It may just be a, a picture of a WhatsApp or a couple words or something, but I, I've just seen a lot come through that tells me that, okay, God's moving here and God is working in this church as he always is, but something special has happened this, this month, something really special. So I, I want to, let's look at what God has done. Let's look at what you guys have done. So we as a church said uh, in the month of uh, October, what month are we in now? It's October, so September, right? Okay, we, we said, I'm going to ask you for the year later, so, <laughs> yeah, is this water, you know? No, it is, it's water. I've been uh, sinuses for like a month. So, I want to look at what we've done. We asked you guys to give, or I asked you guys to give 2.55 million rand over the course of, of a month, and that, that's a, you know, a really big ask, that's a, you know, an incredibly huge ask. And, uh, you know, today I get the pleasure of telling you, you know, what you guys did in a month, and... Um, it's really special, and before I do, I just want you to know that I, got, I sat with these numbers, and I sat with the incoming gifts, and, and especially on like Friday, or no, on Tuesday this week, and then, well, actually, you know, all week, and I, I just looked at this stuff, and I just thought to myself, like, like man, we, it's probably the most undeserving that I have ever felt as a, as a pastor of this church, um, just, I just really, I felt just, and, and, that, and that's okay, because it's not about me, it's about God. But, but really, that was kind of the feeling that I have, is I, I don't, I just feel the most undeserved, like, I just don't, I don't deserve this. And God, friendly reminder from him, was like, you're, you're right, Chris, you don't deserve this, but they do. And this house does. And so it's just been so comforting to, you know, for me to be able to sit this week in that uh, so over the course of the month, you guys, as a church, first service, second service, you guys have given five hundred and forty-five thousand three hundred and fifty-two and ninety cents. So I want you guys to give yourselves. I want you guys, to, yeah, give yourself a round of applause with that. And and what's really special about this is that this happened. That, uh, through, and we spent a lot of time making sure that we got this right. This happened right here through approximately maybe it's, uh, 60 giving units. And a, a unit is maybe one person or a family, but basically like a, a line item you know, on, the, on the bank account. So there were 60 giving units that gave 545,352 rand and 90 cents. Uh, to, to me, that's, that's just that's incredible. You know, for me, that's really, uh, it's unbelievable. And I, and I know a lot of people could not give because of their financial situation. And hey, that's okay. Like, that's fine. Uh, you guys have heard me talk about the Feroza uh, a lot. I wanted to sell the Feroza for this, uh, which would have gone, taken it to like 545,353,000 rand. Uh, I couldn't find anybody to buy it this month. But when it sells, it'll pop right over here to this. But, um, you know, if you couldn't give like that, that's, I just want you to know that that's, that's okay. 
All right, before we talk about that a little more, uh, what you guys have done with this amount here, uh, oh, before I move on to, the, to now the new number on our total debt, um, what's also incredible about what you did this month, and this is something that we get afraid, we actually get a little afraid of, is when we do a, like a fundraising thing, then we think, well, I hope people still tithe. Like, <laughs> we, we, we still need the tithe. You know, this doesn't uh, replace that. And the amazing thing about you guys this month is that the tithe was the same, if not a, a little bit more. And to, to me, it's, you know, to have these two, you know, buckets of money come in is just really, really, really incredible. So between the tithe and between this, you guys, you know, over the course of a month, you gave, you know, 750,000 rand or so, maybe a little more. And like that's, yeah, you guys can clap. <laughs> So that, that, that takes our debt down. Just so you know, that if you're new here, the reason we're doing this is to get out of debt. Why do we want to get out of debt? Because the next generation matters. And then right now, we are at the, the max for what we could do. We want to hire new people. We want to uh, finish some building projects. We want to launch some ministries. We want to fund some ministries. We want to do some kingdom building projects, taking the kingdom of God in here, out there. And so the faster that we clear this debt out, the more that we can do that. Um, that's been our heart, our motivation for it from the beginning. And so we started with 2.55. And I always told you, hey, two is not a big number. Could be 10, could be 100, you know. Uh, and, but, but the two got even smaller. And so now our total debt is 1.8 million rand. So, I mean, we, yeah, we did good. Now, just to let you know, if no one gives anything else to this, uh, to the Heart for the House, which I personally, I believe that this will be knocked out soon. Um, you know, I don't, have a, I don't have a word from God on when. You know, God's not said, it's here, have faith for this. But I, I believe that this will be knocked out soon. But if nobody else gives a single rand, and we just have our tithe, just the basic tithe that's coming in here, which we are so thankful for uh, with you guys, then what our, our finance team, we've sort of projected that end of 2025, early 2026, then we, we are a debt-free church. And that, so that's... End of 2025. What year are we in now? Yeah, so that's not that far away. And that's if nobody else does anything for this here. I mean, the, the, the Feroza is going to knock a little bit off this. But, uh, you know, I know some other people are going to be, you know, called to give towards this here. Uh, but I think it's going to go quick. So I, I want to talk about what, what I kind of think of as, as the elephant in the room uh, that we asked. I asked for 2.5 in a month. And I kept saying, this is going to happen in a month. This is going to happen in a month. Um, and I, I believe that that's what God told me to say. But we didn't get to that amount. You know, we got to a little over half a million rand. So does that mean that we didn't hear God? Uh, does that mean that somebody out there was unfaithful? You know, there was somebody out there. There were two people. God said, give a million. He told another to give 0.8. And you guys were disobedient. And this is your fault. All right. Shame on you. You've now got the pastor drinking vodka on stage because, you know, in case he's not here, I can say whatever. That's, that's not the way it works, guys. It doesn't work that way. You know, God, God, God spoke, we did, and we got to watch what, what he did. No one heard God wrong. There was no agenda. There was no secret agenda. There were no manipulation tactics. You know, we could have tried to manipulate you guys with like really heartfelt videos and, you know, all that stuff. But, but we, we didn't. Instead, what I wanted to celebrate from day one, we said this on the very first Sunday of the month here, is I wanted to celebrate. The money was the smallest part. And today it, it is the money is the most, actually it's the most insignificant part to this whole thing. It's the smallest part. To me, the biggest part, and this is actually the goal that we did accomplish. This is actually the goal uh, that we can claim. Is It's not so much about paying this off. For me, for you, it's been more about being an obedient and generous church. And we did, we did that. That's us. It, 
I mean, that, that is the thing that we celebrate. And so when I sat this week, I was looking at the gifts and the numbers and all that. It's like they are obedient and they are generous. Even those that could not financially contribute, there's, you're not like a less than because you couldn't give. You're just somebody that, that was unable to give. That's okay. Because we had lots of other things that you did and you participated in. You know, God doesn't have seats. You know, the front row uh, is not reserved for those that gave a certain amount and then the back row for another amount. And then if you gave, you know, you hit a gold standard, then you get to go into, you know, another area or something like that. No, it, we as a church are generous and obedient, no matter how much you gave or you didn't give. This is why the numbers don't matter. The numbers only matter because it releases us to do some more for kingdom building. But for this and for what you did and for what happened last month, the numbers were always the smallest part. The biggest part was that we were obedient and generous. So I was thinking about this. Okay, what, what really happened what is, I mean, what this, okay, if I, I looked at this like a formula. I imagine that there's a, a, a new young pastor of a church and, and, you know, he sits with me and, and uh, he's asking me some questions and, you know, I'm like, I'm wise, I'm, uh, I've got everything figured out, I know all the answers, this is about like six months from now, and I'm able to really like mentor this young guy and, and he's asking me, you know, how did you guys uh, tackle, you know, your debt? And I'm like, okay, well, here's what we did, and here's what I did in my heart. So I always try to kind of think of things through, like, how do we say how we did this thing? And I was thinking, okay, so what really happened in the last month? It, it wasn't, yes, money was given, but that's not actually what really happened. This is the product of what, or the money is the product of what really happened. And actually, it's the smallest product of it. But what really happened this month is a couple key things uh, that we decided to take on as a church. So number one, we went from the impossible, from, from saying that things are impossible, to being okay with the unexplainable. You know, at the beginning, people would say uh, to me, you know, Pastor Chris, 2.5 in a month, did, they'd be like, hey, did you really, I mean, is that really what God said? You know, don't you think it's like, uh, it's better if it's a year or, you know, some, don't you want to take pledges or something like that? I was like, listen, I would love to do that, but that's not what God said, and that's not what I can do. And if I don't do what God said, you guys know I'll catch on fire up here? You'll just see, like, you know, lightning. But what was cool is throughout the month, we went from being okay with the unexplainable. I started to hear more and more of you guys saying things like, I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And then this unexplainable started to leak into your lives and into your families and into your prayer life. And people started to think impossible to me is okay because that means that it's really just unexplainable. And it's unexplainable because there's a God element. And when God steps in with the God element, then who cares if it's impossible or not? And I'm okay with it being unexplainable. I don't ever want to be able to explain what God does. That would be so boring. And, and, and that would take away from who God is. God, what he does, it's unexplainable. And we became a little bit more okay with the unexplainable. Now, the other thing that, that we did as a church, and this is something I really encourage you to do, it's made a huge impact in my life, is we decided to do what God says and then watch what he does. So this, this doing what God says and then watching what he does, this is like the obedience part here. You can't watch what God's going to do or what he's doing if you don't do what God says. You know, you, you've got to, there's a cost to God, to, there's a cost to seeing the miracles of God. And that cost is often just a, a little bit of faith, a little bit of obedience, a little bit of generosity, a little bit of humility. But when we do what God says, that means that we've spoken to God, we've heard something from God. Actually, you don't even have to talk to God for God to talk to you and tell you what to do. But when we hear that and we do what he says, then we get to see what he does. This is what, I mean, I had the pleasure of this. I did what God says. God said to me to do this thing a certain way. And then I got to watch what he does. And it was incredible. It was unbelievable. 
You know, as a church, we've embodied, we've embraced this. We also spent the month in prayer and fasting. I mean, we had for, this was amazing. We did a church-wide fast for three days. And I, I could not believe uh, the amount of people that participated. And I mean, it was just incredibly encouraging. Someone came up to me and said, Chris, I have never in my life gone without eating, ever. But I've been doing this thing. And I was like, oh, that's great. How, you know, how you doing without food? And he said, no, no, no. I'm still eating dinner, <laughs> you know. I'm just not eating in the morning. So, you, you know, you, so it was funny because he acted like he'd never eaten a meal in his life, but he was only skipping two meals. And I had a chuckle at that, but my heart was so moved. It was so moved because for him and what he said, what was happening in his heart was, I'm into this thing. I'm going all in for this. It doesn't matter if you did a water-only fast for three days or if you just you know, skipped a snack once and then you forgot and then you just ate like normal. It, it, it doesn't matter. It's about what was going on here in your heart. And we, we had an amazing participation in this. When we, did, when we broke our fast, uh, we had over 80 people. We didn't take attendance, but I said, guys, don't take attendance. This is just, we're all just here breaking a fast. Who cares how many people come? Now, I w- later, I was like, ah, oh, I wish we'd counted how many people came uh, because that would be really encouraging to know. And uh, my wife and I think Lent and a couple others were speculating, or Brenda Hobbs speculated, you know, maybe around like 80 people came for that. 80 people. 80 people came and participated in prayer and fasting. These are the things that have been happening through the month. We did devotionals together as a church this month. Again, we're talking about what really actually happened. We decided as a church that we were going to leave a legacy that challenges and inspires the next generation. And so we're not going to leave a legacy of problems for them to solve. Instead, we're going to leave one that challenges and inspires the next generation. And then we declared, what is the next generation worth? And we said, well, the next generation is worth everything. It's, it's everything. And then, to top it off, last Sunday, unbelievably uh, powerful service in both services. We, we had an opportunity for you to, to have mustard seed faith. Uh, and so what God says in the Bible, or what Jesus is saying is, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. So he's taking the smallest seed there is and pitching it up against uh, the biggest, most immovable thing that they can think of. And he's saying, you've got the smallest thing against the biggest thing. And this little small thing is, is powerful and big enough to move this big thing here. And so he's saying that if that's the faith that you have. And so I thought, okay, well, let's, let's declare that over some things that we struggle to have faith in. So we had stations set up. We had a chance for people to say, you know, I'm struggling to have faith for, for something, this thing in my life. And take a mustard seed and put it in a communion cup and say, I'm going to work on having faith of a mustard seed for this. So you're declaring faith in areas of your life. And over the two services, we had like a couple hundred um, mustard seeds, you know, in the, in the glass, which still, you know, looked like a tiny little amount. But I looked at that and I looked at it after the service and I just thought, man, this is the, this is the church that we are. We, this is the, the faith that takes us into the next place. I mean, we, I just, I'm overwhelmed by you guys. You know, what really happened in the last month, there were things that were a product of re- really happened. But what really happened was we spent one month united in believing, listening, and doing. We spent one month united in believing, listening, and doing And look at what God did. Can you imagine if it's more than a month and it just becomes our DNA as a church? Actually, you know, I say, can you imagine? But actually, it is becoming that. That, That's why I say, hey, that 1.8 is going to knock off quick because we're still believing, listening, and united and and united in what we're doing. We're still. Uh, a, a church that is, is pushing forward in faith. I mean, this is what happened this month. So if I were to tell that young pastor that was coming for advice, I would say the, the most important thing that you can do 
is you can get your church united in believing, listening, and doing. And then out of that flows everything else. That's why, to me, the money was the smallest part. It's the easiest thing to see because it's a number. But it's the smallest part because what's more important is what happens in your hearts here in this church, what what happened in us as a family. Now, I believe that uh, we as a church are now at the point of no return. So we can't turn back. Even as I was trying to figure out what we're going to preach on this week and next week and next week, I was like, I don't know how to pick another topic yet. And God was saying, you're not ready to, to move on because you guys have spent this month building this incredible faith and letting God build in you and amazing things have happened in you this month in your lives, your families, all of that stuff. It's just really, really good news that has happened. But then we have to do something with that. There has to be a next step for you because if there isn't, then we end up just kind of staying where we are and we end up returning, but we can't return. In fact, if we stay here, then we're just going to fizzle. We're just going to fizzle out. Uh, who played? Uh, who played sport in high school? Rugby, water polo, netball. A couple of you. Most of you are afraid to raise your hand. Who's proud of what you did in high school? Come on, Rhonda Bosch fans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could you imagine if you went back like tomorrow and tried to just jump in and play that sport again? Well, if it's water polo, you probably drown or float if you've gained a lot of weight. If it's, uh, you know, rugby, you get crushed, you know, same with netball. I mean, you wouldn't be able to do it. Why, why is that? Well, you stopped using those muscles and those things fizzled out. Uh, same thing with if you work out at the gym or if you run, if you're training. As soon as you stop doing those things, then it fizzles out. Same thing with your, let's talk about your marriage, your relationship. You go on date nights uh, every week. And, and, and your, your, your relationship, your marriage, it grows, it grows, the intimacy grows, the, the connectedness grows, the knowing each other grows, but then work gets busy, you stop doing the date nights, you stop connecting, you go to bed at different times, and then things start to fizzle out a little bit. The point is, is that if, you don't, if we don't continue to use what we've been given, what we've worked for to build, then we're just going to fizzle out. So I've got some encouragement for you guys. I thought, okay, let me, what can I say? A lot of times I tell you, here's what the Bible says, now go and do that. And for this point, I wanted a verse that was just, here's, here's something I found in the Bible that is encouragement for you, that I can say, yeah, let's be encouraged by this. And it's in Hebrews here. And the author of Hebrews, uh, he's talking to, to the church, to people, and he says, let us seize and hold tightly. So let's grab it. Let's hold tightly to it. This thing that happened this month, anything that happened in your life this month, hold tightly to it. Seize it. Don't let, don't let the world just whisk it away and wish it away. Don't let bad things that come or, or unfortunate events just take everything away that's happened in the last month. Seize it and hold tightly to it. The confession of our hope, this is what we're holding tightly to. The confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is reliable and trustworthy and faithful to his word. That's God. God who promised it. This confession of our hope that we hold on to without wavering. This is as we are confessing that in God we have hope. We're confessing that we're okay with unexplainable. We're confessing that we're okay with doing what he says and watching what he does. We're confessing that, that his love is enough for us. And we're confessing that we're holding tightly to it. And then it goes on in verse 24 and says, Then let us consider thoughtfully, intentionally, how we may encourage one another to love and do good deeds, not forsaking our meeting together as believers for worship and instruction, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more faithfully, as you see the day of Christ approaching. Encouraging one another. You know, where we are now, moving forward, we need to encourage each other. I can encourage you guys, but you guys need to encourage each other. Because that's how we together seize and hold tightly to what God has done here. And if I see somebody that I know here that I have a relationship with here in this church, if I see, if I see you letting go, and if I see what God's done in your life over the last month start to drift away and start to fade out of your life, 
that I'm going to do. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to encourage you. And I'm going to say, hey, come on, man. Hey, come on. What, remember what God did. Let's hold tightly to that. And let's keep going. So I wanted to give you a way uh, to keep going. I wanted to give you a way to, to continue to build. So how would we do that? So how would we... Uh, God's done something. And God's done something in our lives. We've changed as a church and as people. We've, we've done some incredible things. Uh, we don't want to forget about it. We don't want to uh, let go of it. We want to hold on to it. We want to continue to work in it. We don't want to fizzle out. So then what do we do? And that's where I thought about a bit of a language change here. And so what we do is we become, we become a, a term, this term, we become difference makers. So we, we become a difference maker. So this is, it's not overcomplicated. It's somebody that has made a difference. Now, that, that could be, um, it could be a person, a thing, it could be an amount, it could be a blessing, you know, whatever it is. But what I'm asking specifically is I'm asking you guys to now take this newfound faith, this newfound heart for this house, and the invitation is now that you become a difference maker, which is meaning that you're going to take on the identity that God has laid out before you to now become a difference maker. And you should get excited about this. So here's the way, best way I thought to explain it. Because uh, I work out, I go to the gym, I like doing stuff like that. And um, one of the things that I love to see is like young teenagers at the gym. Because they get in front of the mirror and they like, you know, they flex and, you know, and, and they look like, you know, yeah, they're just like, and, and they have no shame. So they're out in like the middle public space, you know. And they're just sitting there like flexing. And what I'll see on them is they, they will have like finally one muscle, okay? <laughs> Not a bunch, one. If you've ever had teenagers in your life, uh, at least boys, when they, you know, first discover like that one facial hair or that one muscle, you know, that they've got on their body, and you see them always like walking across the mirror and being like, you know, it's like... <laughs> I would be like, why are you walking like this? Are you having a stroke or something, you know? And, you know, they're, you know, like just walking around. And I, I'm like, okay, here's what's happened with them. They've discovered something that, that has made like a, that they feel like is a difference maker for them. I've got this muscle. I've got this chin hair. As I'm now growing. I'm now a man, you know. I'm doing this thing. And if you give them any opportunity that they can take, they will take that opportunity to use or show off that one muscle or that one hair. Because it's made a difference, but they are excited about the difference that that has made in their life. Now, I feel like in the same way, there are some of us, I want to talk about uh, a group um, uh, of young, the ne basically the next generation that comes here. Um, and they come and they serve and they volunteer. And I feel like instead of having uh, a bottom at the, at the bottom of their glass, they just have like a magic sponge down there. And this magic sponge that they have, no matter how much we pour in, they soak it up. And we just can't get it. We can't even get water to accumulate in the jar because when we pour, pour in, it just soaks and it soaks and it soaks and it soaks. You know, you know why? Because... They've taken this mentality, this heart, and they realize that they are difference makers. They realize that they have an opportunity to use their gifts and talents to actually make a difference. And so we just keep giving them things to do, you know, pick up trash, fix the chairs, you know, things like that. And now it's turning into other things and we want it to continue to be other things and, and bigger things and more and more and more and more. Because we've got a group of people, the next generation, which is worth everything to us, who has realized that they get an opportunity to use their passions, their gifts, and their talents here to make a difference. You don't have to wait on God to call you to make a difference. You don't need to sit there and say, Okay, God, let me know how I can make a difference here in this church. God will, look, God will say, You know what? I've, I've, already, I've already told you. Just look at your gifts and talents. Look at your gifts and go and use them. 
You, you, we're waiting on God to speak something into our lives. And God's like, I've already, I've already spoken it. I've already given it to you. I've already given your gifts and talents. Go and use that. I've already given your passions. Go and use it. I, I remember in my life when I first really worked out that I was called uh, into missions. I used to say after I got saved, like, you know, I felt called into, into ministry, into foreign missions but I, I, I was like waiting on God to say something else. I don't know what it was that I was waiting for. And like 12 years later, I'm, I'm meeting with a pastor friend of mine. And I'm like, I just want God to call me. And he was like, what are you talking about? You're called. And I was like, well, you know, I heard something, felt something when I gave my life to Christ. But I'm just waiting to hear from God now. And he's like, you, you're already, like God's shouting. You're just not listening. You're already called. And he explained this thing to me that, Chris, you've got a calling someone else doesn't have. And God gave you a calling, a passion, gave you gifts and talents. That's your calling. Stop waiting on God. Just walk into who you are and be what God has given you to be and what God has given you to do. Go and make the difference with that. And that was such a, a freeing thing for me that I don't need God's permission I don't have to say, okay, well, let, me, you know, let me go pray and ask God about that. Because God's usually like, I've already said yes, I've already made a way, I've already funded it, I've already done this. Why are you waiting on me to talk? It's, all, it's already done. You have a gift, you have a talent. There's something in you that's not in me. And that's something in you that's not in me or your neighbor or the person you're sitting by is what makes you a very, very unique difference maker. I want to give you a couple areas where you can ap apply this. And these are places where I felt like, okay, if we take this difference making uh, language and we take this identity that I'm calling you guys into here, where are some places that you can apply it? Because I don't want it to fizzle out. You've got that one little weird muscle in your arm that you walk around and flex in front of the mirror. Now, how do you grow it? How do you continue to use it? How do you get, you know, two muscles? And so I wanted to Help you guys walk in that. A couple areas here. The first one, and this is one that people uh, overlook and they ignore, but y you can be a difference maker in your own life. So you need to be a difference maker in yourself, your own life. All right? So that, that means that you have to accept that you are no longer a victim. All right? Stop living with a victim mentality. You know, stop living feeling like, oh, I wish I could. Oh, I wish I was able. Or it's not fair that this has happened to me. And stop living that way. You know, uh, stop, stop. If, you're, if, if you need to go on the diet, go on the diet. If you need to uh, go into therapy, go into therapy. If you need to... Uh, um, Work through past trauma in your life. Work through the past trauma in your life. But it, it starts with you. Be the difference maker for yourself. What do you need to do that makes a difference in you? You know, I, that rhymes. What do you need to do that makes a difference in you? Take that one home. Galatians 4 says this for us. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. You're no longer a bond servant, but you are a son. And by son, it also means daughter here. But you are a son, and if a son, then also an heir through the gracious act of God through Christ. It's just, guess what? Guess what can't be enslaved? A son, someone that's an heir to Christ. You know, you're living like you're a slave because you're, you're probably not allowing or accepting a sonship from God. You need, to, you need to let go of that. You need, to, you need to stop living like a victim. Stop living like a slave. So I've got a saying uh, for you that I hope is inspiring and inspirational. And it's do the thing. So I don't know what this thing is in your life. But for you to be a difference maker in yourself, do the thing. You just need to do it. Stop making excuses. You just need to do it. If you've been talking about joining the gym... And you've been talking about it and talking about it and still haven't joined uh, the gym. Do the thing and join the gym. If you, if, if, you, know, you don't want to snap at your kids and you want to have a better you know, relationship, you've got to work on yourself. How do you work on yourself? Do the thing, which is go to bed on time and wake up early and pray. Talk to God and read your Bible. 
just pick a page, read it. It won't do you any harm. But you got to do the thing. Whatever it is you know you need to do, do it. When's the best time? I always thought this was funny. Uh, I'm running out of time again, but uh, when's the best time to start a, a diet? All right, Monday. Yeah, Monday. Yeah, tomorrow is, is the other one. Like, you know, because uh, on Tuesday, when I've, when I've thrown that away, it's like, okay, I'll, you know, start on, I'm going to start on Monday. I'm gonna do, no, do the thing. Do the thing now. When's the best time to start training yourself to wake up early so that you can have a cup of coffee and pray and talk to God? It's, it's now. Do the thing. Another place uh, where you can be a difference maker, and this is a big one for us here, is you can be a difference maker in your home. You are not a victim in your home, and your home is not a victim. You get the chance to dictate what happens in your home. You get that chance. You get the chance. You have the opportunity to pray over your children's rooms. You have the opportunity to anoint them with oil. You have the opportunity to walk in your children's rooms and say, God, show me what I need to see in this room. You have the opportunity. Guess what? Oh, this is amazing. This is going to rock some of your worlds here. Uh, you've got the opportunity to say one of, the most, one of the most helpful things that you could ever say to your kids in your home. It's simple. It's No. You do. You can tell them that. Because in your home, your home is a difference-making home. And when, when your kids or your family, your spouse, your whatever, your partner walks into your home, then they walk into an anointed place that you have taken ownership of and a difference has been made there. Now, I love what Joshua says here uh, in 2415. He says, if, if it is unacceptable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves. So he's saying, hey, if you're not happy with God and what God's doing, then choose your call. Choose for yourself. You could choose to serve. Uh, you could choose whether it's the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river. So he's saying, remember the God that freed you and got you to this place. You could choose to serve that God or you could choose the gods of the Amorites who were about to enslave them and capture them in whose land that you live. And he's, Joshua's saying, pick one. Just pick. And I love what Joshua says about his house because he declares it over his house. And that's is what became the difference maker in his home. And he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You, know, you, you have the authority to walk through your home when you leave this place today and declare this over every, every brick, over every room, over every bed, over the kitchen, over everything in your home. You ought to walk around the house today and say, I have the authority by God. Pastor Chris told me God would, would, would do this here. And so as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Now, the other thing uh, that you can be a difference maker in is in your relationships. And you know what this means? Uh, this means some of you need to forgive. It means some of you need to, need to let go of some pride. It means you need to let go of some uh, offense. It means you need to stop waiting for them to do something for you, them to apologize to you. You know, life is short here, guys. It's really short. And relationships are all we have with each other. That's what's really important. Our relationships are important. And it's time that you let go of some pride and you make a step towards making a difference in those relationships. It's time that you let go of some pride. You let go of some hurt, which now has become pride. Like, I'm not going to go talk to them or I'm not going to apologize. They, they owe me an apology. It's time that you let that go. And you say, I've got some relationships that I need to hand over to God. I've got some relationships that I can make a difference in. I, I, this has happened to me many times uh, because I'm, I'm a sinful, prideful. I'm, a, I'm the, the chief of all sinners, as Paul would say. You know, you're upset with somebody and you're like, I'm not. No, they deserve to be hated. They, they des you know, like I'm not taking a step towards them at all. 
And then they take a step towards me, and they're like, hey, I, you know, just... Just want to say sorry, you know, I, I feel like, you know, you're hurt or you're offended at something I did. I don't know what I did, but can we just talk about it? And I, I'm like, no, I don't want to talk because I want to be mad at you instead. You know, and I always think like, well, what if I had been humble enough to make that step towards them? Because I know they made a difference in my life. What if I could have made the difference in their life? So guys, when you walk out of this room today, go find a relationship that needs some help. And go make a difference in that relationship. Uh, I want to read a verse for you in Matthew 5. I want you to know there's scripture attached to all these things here. But it says, if you're presenting your offering at the altar, and while there you remember that your brother has something, such as a grievance or a complaint against you, leave your offering there at the altar and go. So God, Jesus is saying, what you think is your sacrifice, what you're bringing to me is not that important. That's not actually the sacrifice. The sacrifice is sacrificing your pride or sacrificing the way that you feel. And instead, he says to first make peace with your brother and then come and present your offering. Come to terms quickly. And then in Ephesians 4, just for more evidence of this, evidence that we can be difference makers in relationships, do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth. Ever. That, that's how we become difference makers in relationships. We need to first do the work in us so that we stop spewing foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words over everybody and everything around us. Instead, we're only supposed to use speech that is good for building up others according to the need and the occasion, so that it will be a blessing to them. Be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving. That's what God is calling us to here. That's how we make a difference in our relationships. Now, I've got more. I just don't have time to go through more of them. But a, sort of a final takeaway for you guys is, is this. I'm putting the call to this church that you become difference makers, that you make a difference. Let's make a difference in the 1.8, but... Let's make a difference in yourself. Let's make a difference in your relationships, in your home, in your family, in your finances, in all of those areas. But you've had something happen this month, and you're here. right now. You're in this moment right here. And when this service ends, you're going to walk out those doors. And I don't want you to walk out of here unchanged. I don't want you to walk out of here without knowing that there is something in your life, whether it's you, your home, your family, your finances, whatever it is, there's something in your life that you need to do the thing and make the difference. And you know what that thing is. God will put a relationship on your mind. God will speak to you. Uh, God will show you numbers. God will whatever. God will do it all. God will reveal in you Something that you need to do in you. And sometimes we need to stop trying to make a difference in others until we make the difference in us first. But it's hard to work here. It's easier to work out there. It's hard to work in here. But I want you to walk out those doors with, with knowing that you are special. You are incredible. You are generous. You are obedient. You are uh, celebration worthy. And you can walk out here and you can make a difference. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Heavenly Father, I pray that you just reveal to everybody in this room a place where they can make a difference. A place where, uh, where they, know, they know the thing that they need to do. And that you would reveal it to them. I pray, Father, that you would put on people's hearts and minds that you would put... You would give them very, very, very clear direction. That people would become aware of their giftings and their talents and how to use it. That people would uh, become aware of places where they can work on themselves and where they can work on their families. And Father, I just speak that over this room. Lord, I've done all that I can do. And I need the Holy Spirit. I need you to work in this audience, in this crowd. And God, I surrender them to you. And I trust that you're going to do it because you're, you're the ultimate difference maker.
Thank you for making a difference in my salvation. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.